And the focus this week is Carl Jung and um, his take on the imagination. I wanted to say as, as sort of another almost kind of way into this evening, um, just to talk about another kind of case really. Um, and it's the case of Einstein, Albert Einstein. Um, I don't know if I mentioned him last week, but he's quite well known for this quote of his, which is, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. So that's imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. And he's saying in a way, I think there, that you know, the imagination, a bit like Andrew Marvel's image of um, the imagination taking flight, um, that that's what the imagination can do. And then it's from that that you might, as it were, derive some knowledge. I don't know, pull down or articulate some knowledge. Um, but it's the imagination that's prior. Um, and this idea that it encircles the world, it's actually a very old idea. You can read in ancient philosophers about how they traverse the cosmos in their imaginations. Um, but what's really interesting about Einstein is that his imagination was hugely productive. In fact, it changed um, modern physics. Um, he's well known for having imagined what it might be like to travel on a light beam. And from that, he derived the special theory of relativity because his imagination prompted some ideas about what would happen to time and space as you were traveling on a light beam. And it led to, for example, his famous realization that light, um, nothing travels faster than the speed of light, um, which is um, one of the premises from which um, special relativity is derived. And Walter Isaacson and his very brilliant biography of Einstein spends quite a lot of time asking, you know, what was it that Einstein had that enabled him to use his imagination in that way? And it's not dissimilar from what Jung decided as well. Um, Isaacs, um, Isaacson says that um, uh, Einstein said, look, he said he had no special talents, um, but that he was passionately curious. Um, and that combination of not just idle curiosity, but a kind of passionate curiosity, it has a bit of energy to drive it, um, a bit of kind of eros in the broadest sense um, that drives that sense of wanting to peer in and to go further, to discover something elsewhere. Um, and Isaacson said he thought that probably that curiosity of Einstein was relatively unusual. Um, he said also that Einstein had a kind of playfulness and his playfulness was unashamed. You know, he wasn't ashamed to imagine what it might be like to ride on a light beam. I don't know many physicists, but you can imagine that many professionals in their field wouldn't want to do something that you might think a child would do. Um, or maybe you'd read about in a sci-fi book, um, but wouldn't want to bring into your work. Um, but it seems that that was the, the launch pad for Einstein in this way. So that playfulness, um, free from embarrassment or shame or a place where you, know, you think you oughtn't to do or oughtn't to go, um, there's a kind of uh, a freedom a liberty in Einstein's imagination as well. Um, he could marvel and wonder um, was another of Isaacson's conclusions. And this is more than just, um, you know, gate gawping, if you like, or gazing. Um, this is um, the sense that wonder actually opens up new worlds to us, that it's like a kind of threshold or a gateway. Um, so when we are wondering, when we marvel, um, we're not just having a kind of peak experience, and um, we're being invited to consider that this might be the entry point into something further. Um, I think this was reflected in Aristotle's thought that in philosophy, in wonder or philosophy begins and in wonder it ends. And that's not just saying that philosophy, by which he meant very generally the study of the world um, is a wonderful thing to do, although it, it certainly is. Um, it's to say that wonder and marveling are part of that investigation. And the reason why it begins and ends with wonder is that um, you start off 
with the wonder and then you discover things, you articulate things, you find out things. Um, but you find it ends in wonder too because the journey um, could continue ad infinitum into reality. Um, so wonder is a key notion to hold in mind too. Um, there's another kind of freedom that Einstein had, um, which was a freedom from received wisdom and dogma, Isaacson concludes. Um, and now this is not to say that he just dismissed received wisdom and dogma. He actually knew it when in the case of physics, you know, extraordinarily well, um, but he didn't use it to tie him down. He used it to maybe inform or discern his imagination, um, but was free to move beyond it as well. And I don't know, you see this quite a lot, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm working through Dante's Divine Comedy at the minute um, and, and posting um, a, a, a YouTube or a, um, a blog on each of the cantos. And one of the things which I'm realizing is that Dante knew his medieval theology hugely well. Um, he knew his Aristotle very well, for that matter, as well. But he presents them as kind of starting points, almost, those kind of dogmas and insights, those bits of received wisdom. Um, and they're really helpful. They're definitely pointers and indicators and help you discern what you're experiencing, what you're encountering. Um, but they, you need to be free with them as well um, to be able to move beyond them. Um, and then fifthly, um, Isaacson said that um, Einstein was sure that imagination has a purpose. So he was convinced that imagination is part of the toolkit that human beings have. It is a really crucial capacity that we have for exploring ourselves, the world, other worlds. Um, it has a purpose um, and he committed to it. Um, and this is, I think, is quite unusual in the modern world where there's plenty of imagination around you know, you only have to flick through Netflix or um, go to an online art gallery or whatever it might be and realize that there's plenty of imagination around. Um, but it's often treated as fantasy. This distinction I made last week with Coleridge, the idea that fantasy puts things together in fun ways, in imaginative ways, in um, playful ways. And it can be entertaining, it can be amusing, um, uh, it can be distracting. Um, but there's a deeper kind of imagination which produces things which have, are generative and are lasting, are creative. They take us into new worlds because they expand our sense of this world. And that purpose seems to have been what Einstein got onto as well. And it's certainly core to Jung's ideas. The imagination runs right through his whole psychology. Um, in a way, it's the kind of vehicle for his psychology. Um, it definitely has a purpose. So the sense of being passionately curious, um, playful, taking marvel and wonder seriously as thresholds, knowing but being free with received wisdom and dogma, and then believing that imagination has a purpose. Um, they certainly were the elements that Walter Isaacson concludes Albert Einstein took to the imagination um, with all the productivity that ensued in his case. So there's a couple of sort of entrees um, into the subject for this evening. Now let's turn explicitly to Jung. Um, I'm, I'll sort of assume that everyone's heard of Jung, um, but uh, I will assume, uh, you know, just sort of basic sense of the man and what he stood for. Um, born in 1875, he died in 1961 um, and he spent the earliest part of his life um, as a psychologist um, working in a large hospital um, and for 10 years was working with what we would now call um, broadly psychotic patients in this hospital. Um, and during that time, he got very interested in what was going on in the psychotic mind. Um, he was in the hospital actually where they first defined um, schizophrenia. Um, and uh, Jung was unusual there because he felt that 
the kinds of things that people with these very troubled conditions, you know, you don't want to romanticize it at all. This is genuine suffering very often. But nonetheless, he tried to take seriously what people were experiencing in these states. They're no doubt troubled, but nonetheless, their imagination was trying to communicate something. And it led him to get interested in the work of Freud, who was already kind of established by this stage. Um, Freud's um, big book on dreams um, came out in 1901 and became a sort of hit um, quite quickly. And Jung got onto it and started corresponding with Freud and felt that Freud's ideas in psychoanalysis um, might help Jung to develop his sense of what goes on in the mind. Um, and they collaborated um, quite closely for a few years before having their famous split. Um, and thereafter, um, they became much more antagonistic um, towards one another. Um, actually, Jung was quite um, sort of reconciled, I think, to um, their split after he got over it. It was, um, it, it was a terrible shock to him. I mean, it seems to have prompted what he came to call his encounter with the unconscious um, in, the, in the years, around, roughly around the First World War. But he became reconciled to it afterwards. And when Freud died, he actually wrote quite conciliatory obituaries to Freud and so on. But they definitely split. And um, in a way, you could say that they split over how seriously they took the imagination. You can discuss this in various ways. But for Freud, broadly speaking, you can say that the imagination was fantastical. Um, it didn't really explore reality. Rather, it served to what he called sublimate our difficult and tricky inner life experiences, our fears, our anxieties, um, particularly those arriving in early life. And the imagination converts those troubled experiences into um, fantasies that we can relate to more easily in order to try to negotiate the difficulties of our inner life. So a classic case for Freud would be the religions that think of God as father. And making it a bit simpler than Freud put it, he's always a very nuanced actually and subtle writer. Um, but nonetheless, he broadly thought that the reason why imagery of God as father is so prevalent in the world is that everyone has fathers um, and the relationship that a child has with its father is always ambivalent. It's always got at least two sides. Say on the one side is protector, but on the other side, um, maybe is in competition for affection from the mother and so on. And the, the way that we all, or many people, I should say many people, um, try to um, live with this tension inside. Remember, this happens very early in your life when you're very vulnerable. Um, so these are often very troubled feelings, Freud assumed, um, is by projecting a father figure into the sky whom you can try and pray to or make sacrifices to or um, give kind of powers to, powers of creation and intervention and control, um, but is a figure that you can kind of relate to as well. Um, so it's an effort to try to live in your adult life with experiences that bedded down in your early life and have become inaccessible because they come from early life. So that's a very imaginative act. I mean, and it's even a collective imaginative act, but it doesn't tell you anything about reality. Freud famously was an atheist. Now Jung disagreed with that. Um, and he disagreed with it in a number of ways. Um, one was he thought that there's a lot more going on in our imaginative life than just the sublimation of particularly these broadly erotic instincts um, to do with care and desire and wanting and pleasure um, that Freud majored on in early life. Um, there could be all sorts of other um, dynamics and powers at, at work, Freud thought, even within our own psyches. Um, so he moved beyond just these erotic um, causes of things. But he also thought that we must inherit what he called the collective unconscious. 
this idea that our minds aren't blank slates when we're born, but much as we have five fingers on each hand because fish have five bones in each of their four fins, and we are evolutionary inheritors of that evolved into hands, so too our minds share in that long, long evolution. And so part of the contents of our minds, part of the contents of our imagination is shaped by that Jung thought. Um, now, one of the things that can be confusing with Jung is that sometimes he seems to be speaking often quite reductively just as a psychologist, you know, brilliant and interesting in its own way. Um, but as if all the things that we imagine are still the product of our psychology, even if it's a shared psychology and a collective psychology. Um, and he can seem a bit ambivalent about whether it's really telling you anything about reality beyond that of our minds or our shared minds. But then at other times he's very clear that the imagination does do that and it has a life of its own. It's sometimes referred to as the imaginal after Henri Corbin's phrase now. Um, and um, that this inside of the whole world, um, this mental reality can combine with the idealist philosophy that I think I mentioned last week, which makes the assumption that the mental is prior to the material anyway. So it would seem, for example, the brain um, as a kind of antenna that tapped into the mental world, tuned it, focused it, selected from it, a bit like eyes tap into the visual world, um, tune, focus and select what we see. Um, and at other times Jung can seem quite like that, particularly towards the end of his life. I think as he became more established, um, he became more expansive in his sense of what his psychology was really about. But that certainly takes him way beyond Jung. Um, and then the third area um, in which Jung really dis uh, distinctly moved on from Freud was actually in the therapeutic technique where he puts the active imagination um, as a central um, activity for anyone in therapy. Um, and active imagination, I'll say a little bit more about it later on, but, but for him, active imagination is much more guided. It's much more directed. It really is going on a journey, following images, engaging with images, um, asking images to speak to you. Now, these images may be derived in all sorts of ways. They may come from dreams. They may come from hypnagogic states. Um, they may come from trance states. Um, they may come from poetry and art. Um, but treating them as um, living entities that you engage with um, when you can. I mean, it can, it's a bit of a knack to be able to do it in such a fulsome way. Um, but for, that's different from Freud because Freud did think that the imagination matters, but he called it, excuse me, he called it free associating, where um, it's just a kind of random production of images. And the function of the analyst in traditional psychoanalysis anyway, um, is to try and make some sense of this random production of the mind. Um, and so it's much less guided. Um, it's sort of the detritus of the, the unconscious, if you like. Um, rather than a sense of um, organized, maybe, if not actual intelligent, um, living entities that the imagination might encounter, which at its best, um, Jung thought the active imagination um, can produce. This has become much clearer in recent years since Jung's so-called Red Book was published. Um, this was a, a document that he worked on throughout his life and he didn't want published actually, um, but it's a very elaborate um, encounter with his own unconscious mind through this product, through this process of active imagination, um, where he, he encountered um, entities repeatedly, and they told him all sorts of things. Um, some were relatively straightforward, some were very gnomic, um, and he produced this book, which is both the text of these encounters, but also um, very beautiful illuminated drawings that accompany it as well. It looks like a medieval manuscript. Um, and people have studied this since it was published, I think about 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and um, it's very clear that this was, became, this was the sort of resource activity for Jung um, from which all his psychology um, came. You can think of his psychology in a way um, as various attempts to try to um, communicate what he felt he discovered through this extraordinary um, four or five years of deep imaginative engagement with his own unconscious, with the, his confront, confrontation with the unconscious.
Um, so why is the imagination so important? Um, Jung said that it's, 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 it's really important because it sets you free and it sets you free in a particular way. Um, it's not axiomatic. Um, and this is paralleling Einstein's ability to take dogma and receive wisdom seriously, but not to be constrained by it. Similarly, the imagination is not axiomatic. It makes all sorts of leaps and associations that can be bizarre and odd and very hard to make sense of. Um, Jung argued it's not discursive as well. So it's not like reason. It doesn't build up arguments. Um, it doesn't work on a kind of logic. And that frees the mind to move into less rational parts as well. And that's part of its liberty. Um, and what it is at heart, he thought, is perceptive. Um, this comes, you know, from the earlier sense of the imagination um, when it's the receipt of the imago, the image, if you remember, um, the, the ancient Greeks um, would have thought when they said to imagine, they would have said it was receiving the imago, receiving the image. And something of that um, stays very central to Jung's idea. Um, not imagos from the external world, necessarily, uh, sort of theory of optics, but the imago from um, the inner world. Um, so it's perceptive. Um, and it can help you see what you don't yet see. Um, it's a bit like, you know, a new dawn or the lights coming up um, or being in a sort of darkened room and wondering what's there. Um, our conscious minds, our egos tend to work on the assumption that we're seeing all that's important. And Jung became very, very clear that we're not remotely seeing all that's important in our lives at all. Our lives are far more powerfully shaped by what is broadly unconscious to us. And these various imaginative exercises enable us to perceive more and more of those often unconscious dynamics. He also thought the imagination is freeing because um, it goes beyond established reactions. Again, the ones that we're familiar with if we pay any attention to ourselves in the waking state of mind. Um, and it also goes beyond sort of settled collective habits of behavior, the kind of assumptions of our times or culture or religion. Um, and that freedom, which can often be quite disturbing. Um, if you pay any attention to your dreams, you'll realize that you dream all sorts of things um, that you would never dream of doing in waking life. Um, and, but that in itself is, is freeing, Jung thought. And it's cru crucial to understanding and discovering new worlds again. Um, and it's why it's so important in therapy, because whatever else, a dream or a fantasy um, or a, um, a projection onto a therapist or whatever else it might um, be about, um, it's very likely to be about um, your own personal story and those parts of yourself, which for one reason or another, you're not hugely conscious of. And so this freedom of the imagination is why it's so central to therapy, because it provides clues and hints and nudges as to what's going on in this broader part of yourself that is so powerful. So let me expand that a little more by just thinking about one key source of our own, certainly our own personal imaginative lives. Um, you may well have many more yourself, but it's one that we all do. Um, and this is dreaming. Um, not everyone remembers their dreams, although you can, I think, always work to remember dreams um, just by putting a pen and a piece of paper by your bed and uh, sort of having the intention to remember them. Many, many people um, find they do start remembering dreams when they do that, even if they didn't before. But you'll know that your dreams are quite extraordinary. Um, you know, you can, you can dream things every night that if you sat down in broad daylight, um, you'd think you could never conjure out of your, your mind. Um, certainly if you're me anyway, um, the imagination is quite extraordinary in dreams. Um, and again, this is one of the ways that Freud differed, Jung differed from Freud because Freud thought that dreams are actually um, an attempt to stay asleep. Um, that what our dreams are doing when they work is actually um, screening us from our anxieties. 
Um, and it's when the dream fails that we wake up and remember it, which is why often, you know, when you wake up, you feel a bit troubled by it or you um, feel you're dreaming something you really, really want. Um, as it were, the dream has sort of failed in that moment to actually keep you asleep. Um, the best dreams, I don't know, might be of an antagonist who you defeat um, and you defeat easily in the dream. And so it helps you stay asleep. And it's when you get into an, a scrap with the antagonist and you're not sure whether you're going to defeat them that you wake up with some sort of nightmare, perhaps. Um, so Freud thought that dreams are there to keep us asleep. Um, and for the most part, they very often work because we don't wake up with dreams. We have many, many more dreams than we remember upon waking up. Um, but Jung thought they're different. Um, Jung thought that um, dreams are an attempt of the unconscious to rebalance our psyches. Um, he was very influenced, um, not just by Charles Darwin with the evolutionary element that I mentioned earlier on, but also by the idea that in nature, um, nature tries to achieve homeostasis. It tries to achieve balance, you know, whether that be balance of temperature, um, balance in population size, in all sorts of ways, um, homeostasis seems to be operative in nature. And um, Jung thought the same must be therefore true in our minds as well. And he thought that dreams come up when we need to balance a, a, a waking um, assumption or experience. Um, you know, so you may hate someone during the day and then you dream that you're best friends. Um, and the dream is inviting you to see in your waking life the side of the person that will enable you to have a better relationship, for example. And that might be one dream, just a sort of small example of how that can work. Now, dreams can be very complicated. Um, and in fact, Jung also thought that the best way to work with dreams is not to try and interpret them too quickly, um, but to stay with the dream imagery as much as possible. Um, so when you wake up to, as it were, half stay in the dream, or when you remember it later, to try and go back into that slightly trance state where the dream starts to take on a life of its own again, and just see where it runs. And this has two advantages, according to Jung, because on the one hand, the dream may more have to show you. And so if you let it run, you might see more of it. But also um, the dream is doing its own work in its own way. And in a way, that's the most important thing. Um, and if the waking mind tries to sort of grab it and interpret it too quickly, it actually reduces the, the power of the dream. Um, and it's one of the reasons why Jung was so influential in things like art therapy and sandpits and play and so on, is that um, that's a way of staying in this imaginative state through the production of art, images, through playing. Um, and um, that in a way is the most important thing in this Jungian sense of things. Um, Jung thought that we're dreaming all the time actually. Um, and that when we're awake, it's just that our dreams tend to get concealed by the daylight of our conscious minds, a bit like the stars are still in the sky even when the sun's shining, but we just don't see them. Um, and, you know, but we can daydream and, and every so often, maybe when we get shocked, um, a dream will actually come up. Um, and that's why part of the reason why um, we can fear and be shocked um, because we lose touch with reality, with what's actually going on directly. And it gets overlaid with, um, products of the imagination. And then of course, if uh, people have um, periods of madness of one sort or another, um, that's when the dream life gets too um, confused with waking life. Um, and so that's one of the ways of trying to understand madness in Jung's conception, um, that uh, people lose the boundary, the capacity to discern between the conscious and the unconscious life. Um, so, you know, it is important to be able to do so, but it's also important to be able to be free enough to ease too rigid a boundary between the two as well. Um, and he thought, though, that um, dreams... Um, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do now, actually. I'm just going to read, um, show you, I think, a passage from um, a bit of Jung. Um, that, that maybe shows you how he um, used dreams in his waking life. Um, he, he thought this play and so on was very, very powerful. And he remembers that um, when he was a child, he did it quite spontaneously, in fact. 
Um, if you have read his book, Memories, Dreams and Reflections, um, his broadly, it's autobiographical, um, but it's often not a lot about what happened. It's much more about what was going on inside. Um, and he gives some examples of how his dreams were very, very important to him in early life. And they're waking dreams, um, waking states of imagination, as much as when he was asleep. Um, and so if I share a screen again, I, I've got a bit of text. It's always good to have a bit of text from the people we're talking about, if not their actual images, and um, because um, then um, we get something of their direct spirit as well. So I hope you can see that text. This is a clip from Memories, Dreams and Reflections. And what Jung is describing here, I'll read it out in a moment, but what Jung is describing here is a, a game that he played when he was a child and he came to reflect on later. And he said that when he was a child, he was often very troubled actually in life. He had quite a disturbed childhood for various reasons. Um, and he realized that his dream play enabled him to cope with that disturbance. And so I'll just read this out. He said, my disunion with myself and uncertainty in the world at large led me to an action which at the time was incomprehensible to me. I had in those days a yellow varnished pencil case of the kind commonly used by primary school pupils with a little lock and the customary ruler. At the end of this ruler, I now carved a little mannequin about two inches long with frock coat, top hat and shiny black boots. I coloured him black with ink, sawed him off the ruler and put him in the pencil case, which made him a little bed. I even made a coat for him out of a bit of wool. In the case, I also placed a smooth oblong blackish stone from the Rhine, which I painted with watercolours to look as though it were divided into an upper and lower half and had long carried around in my trouser pocket. This was his stone, the mannequin stone that went in the box in the bed with him. All this was a great secret. Secretly, I took the case to the forbidden attic at the top of the house, forbidden because the floorboards were worm-eaten were worm, were worm and rotten, and hid it with great satisfaction on one of the beams under the roof, for no one must ever see it. I knew that not a soul would ever find it there. No one could discover my secret and destroy it. I felt safe, and the tormenting sense of being at odds with myself was gone. In all difficult situations, whenever I had done something wrong or my feelings had been hurt, or when my father's irritability or my mother's invalidism, invalidism oppressed me, I thought of my carefully bedded down and wrapped up mannequin and his smooth, prettily coloured stone. And from time to time, often at intervals of week, I secretly stole up to the attic when I could be certain that no one would see me. Then I clambered upon the beam, opened the case, and looked at my mannequin and his stone. So there's a brilliant bit of kind of cell therapy, um, which Jung, because he was free with his imagination, you might say, you know, lots of children might do something a bit like that, but that does seem to be, um, you know, really quite extensive. Um, and it really helped him. And um, because I think you could say that um, it enabled him to manage his inner life by this imaginative relationship with the mannequin and the stone in the bed care you know um it felt safe that feels a key moment in the description there um it was secret um that was absolutely crucial um i think because um uh, maybe he needed to feel that he could control it he could manage it um that he could act um, in relation to um, his dis disunion with himself. Um, you know, Donald Winnicott, who's the English psychotherapist, who I think in many ways is quite Jungian, actually, um, he would look to what he called transitional objects in describing this. Um, if you know, you've had a child, or maybe yourself, you know, if you sucked your thumb or you had a bit of a rag or you had a special toy, um, you'll know that it's really, really important to children that you don't disturb the rag you know you, as a parent you don't say oh it's a bit dirty I'll just wash it and that's deeply upsetting to the child because it too is imaginatively loading something into the rag often it is a sense of safety um, but if Jung you know could do that as a child then clearly um, as a therapist um, the use of the imagination um, is very you know very suggestive um, and 
um, you know, that worked for him. Um, but if it didn't work for him and he came to therapy later in life, then you might talk to him about it and how it did work, how it didn't work and discover something about um, what he called his disunion with himself. Jung also thought that um, the, um, our imagination, our unconscious is inhabited by these entities which aren't just our own though, as it were. You know, Jung, in that case, Jung created the mannequin. Um, he painted the stone, he put it into its bed. Um, they were contents of what you might call the pers personal unconscious or conscious for him, his personal imaginative life. Um, but Jung also realized, um, this goes back to his days in the psychiatric hospital, um, that people experience things in their imaginative lives that couldn't have come just from them. Um, either they couldn't have directly experienced them at all, or um, they are shared images um, that many people have. Um, so it seems it's not just the product of one mind, but um, rain reaches across a lot of minds. I mean, the, the, the sort of sense of God the Father uh, might be part of that. Um, and I wanted to read another section where he describes the power of that and begins to introduce us to his notion of archetypes, um, which is how he describes this part of um, our imaginative lives. So this is from a paper um, called um, uh, The Transcendent Function. It's just a few sentences, but again, to get some sense of how Jung could talk about this. Um, so he's talking about archetypes here. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about what archetypes are, but let me just read this passage first. He said, um, many of them appear spontaneously in dreams and so on, and more, many more can be made conscious through active imagination. In this way, we find that thoughts, feelings and affects are alive in us, which we never have believed possible. Naturally, possibilities of this same sort, this sort seem utterly fantastic to anyone who has not experienced them himself for a normal person who knows what he thinks. Such a childish attitude on the part of the normal person is simply the rule, so that no one without experience in this field can be expected to understand the real nature of archetypes. With these reflections, one gets into an entirely new world of psychological experience, provided of course that one succeeds in realizing it in practice. Those who do succeed can hardly fail to be impressed by all that the ego does not know and never has known. This increase in self-knowledge is still very rare nowadays and is usually paid for in advance with a neurosis, if not something worse. So here he's moving us on a bit um, and suggesting that there are kind of dynamics and forces at work inside our psyche um, that we may personally be unrelated to in the sense of being the creators of them and yet they have very powerful effects on our lives. Now in a way this isn't so surprising um, because archetypes for him, for Jung, included for example the ability of a bird to build a nest even when it's never been taught or seen a nest being built. Um, that for Jung is one kind of archetype. Um, I think some birds do learn how to build nests from watching, um, but many don't, I understand. Um, another archetype would be those that are often explored in mathematics. So you might say there's an archetype of a triangle. Um, it seems to have a kind of existence that maths discovers rather than creates. Um, and um, many mathematicians do have this experience of exploring a kind of archetypal world. Um, so that sense that there's more going on in the inner life of things um, than we often assume, certainly these days, actually makes quite immediate sense. Um, but he thought that um, there are archetypes in our own psyches too. Um, and a, a common one that's discussed nowadays is the archetype of the shadow. Um, and this is parts of ourselves that um, we don't like for one reason or another. We try to keep at bay, but that very act of keeping it at bay sort of forms it into what Jung called a complex, which is a kind of entity that has meaning and affect attached to it by us, often, in this case anyway, um, affect of fear. And it has a kind of autonomous life of its own. And we may often not know about our shadow, 
um, it just pops up every so often when we meet someone and for some reason we don't really understand, can't bear to be in their presence, say. Um, and one possibility there is that this person is too close to the shadow inside you. Um, and so when you see them, you are also unconsciously seeing your shadow and want to get out of their presence. And then he also thought that um, what can happen is that at the collective level, some individuals or maybe some saints um, embody um, collective archetypes as well. And that's why they become so impressive and so important. Um, I mean, you might wonder why some politicians, for example, um, we seem to relate to them as more or less successful politicians, whereas other politicians, we seem to relate to them in a much um, more sort of strange and bigger in a way, more powerful way. Um, and that, Jung would say, is because they are embodying or personifying archetypes for us all. Um, and, you know, so figures like, say, Trump or figures maybe even like Boris Johnson here in the UK, um, people don't really relate to them rationally. Um, they relate to them in a more visceral or primitive way. Um, and, you know, certainly in Trump's case, it's one way of understanding how he can so divide America um, that one group of people see him as one kind of archetype, uh, maybe the trickster savior, something like that. Whereas others look at him and see him in a completely different light and see him as, um, you know, maybe mad or maybe devilish or whatever it might be. Um, some public figures do seem to take on this bigger role. And Jung would say that's because they embody an archetype. Um, and then, of course, in, in religions, in spiritual traditions, um, saints and gurus and um, wise figures, you know, they may in part be very wise. Um, but when they um, take on a life of their own um, and um, the devotion to them, say, becomes somewhat excessive um, or when after they die, um, they're remembered through icons and stories and myths and so on. Um, Jung would say that's because they become personifications or embody an archetype that it's important for us to relate to. So we're coming to 20 past nine already. Um, there's more that could be said about this. Um, I hope this is nudging us towards how Jung would understand the imagination helps us to see the divine which he became clearer and clearer about towards the end of his life. Um, you know, the imagination in this area is kind of the intermediary zone um, where our own individual life, inner life, um, if you know it well enough, then you start to be able to discern what's your stuff and what is wider stuff um, and stuff that you can relates to as independent of your own psyche, even if it's received through your psyche. And the great spiritual adepts, for example, are the ones who don't project onto God, um, but do start to see something of the divine as the divine reveals itself to them through this powerful imagination, through the sense of wonder, through the sense of curiosity. Um, that is the purpose of the imagination um, that Einstein pointed to and knew so well in science, but in the spiritual or the religious sphere. Um, but it's, you know, it takes a lot of work. Um, and um, I guess many of us, most of the time in our spiritual or religious lives are dealing with a sort of strange amalgam of our personal stuff and more objective stuff. And maybe that's why we need organized religions that if we're lucky have done some of the sorting out for us. Um, and so help with that discernment. Um, but also, you know, spiritual practice um, in one way or another can be thought of as, first of all, becoming familiar with our imaginative lives inside in the Jungian sense, in order that we can start to discern what is what, you know, where it's coming from our own energy um, to do with our own immediate pasts, where it's perhaps coming from the culture in which we live, that aspect, and there may be even a sense that something has a genuinely transcendent life of its own as well. 